For centuries, we've grappled with the mystery of the Holy Grail. Was it really the cup used at the Last Supper by Christ and his disciples? And where is it today? It's the ultimate adventure, one of history's great detective stories. Over the centuries, dozens of historians, archaeologists, adventurers, and rulers have sought to piece together the ancient puzzle and find the one true Holy Grail. Some say it was the cup used at the Last Supper. Others claim it caught Christ's blood at the crucifixion. For some, it's not a cup at all, but a spiritual journey. It's not just a cup. It's an object of enormous spiritual significance and power. If it is found, it will be the archaeological and religious event of the last 2,000 years. But could it really have survived since the death of Christ over 2,000 years ago? Piecing together the evidence, working with the experts, and carefully tracing back through history, we'll try to find the answer. There are dozens of cups, chalices, and bowls claiming to be the one true Holy Grail. But there are just four which might be the real deal. A mysterious glass bowl found down a well in Glastonbury, and a wooden healing cup unearthed from an abbey in Wales, both said to have been brought back from the Holy Land to Britain by Joseph of Arimathea. A small stone papal chalice hidden away in Spain for hundreds of years, and an intricately engraved silver chalice unearthed in the ruins of ancient Antioch. The existence of a Holy Grail has split the experts between its supporters... Oh, I think it does exist. The actual cup, yes. I think I know where it is. ...its detractors... You've got to look at a lot of these as tourist trade relics from the Crusades. And those who don't believe it exists at all. I do not think that there is a Holy Grail in existence. I do not think there ever was a Holy Grail in existence. I believe it's a medieval invention. Whatever your belief, the search for the Holy Grail has tantalized people for centuries. The Grail legend has everything a legend needs. It has death, disaster, crusades, resurrection, you name it. Will we ever find it? I hope so. We've identified grails made of wood, glass, and silver. But could it really have survived for over 2,000 years since Christ was crucified by the Romans? If it was the cup used at the Last Supper, we have enough relics from the Roman period and earlier that have survived. Um, so there's absolutely no reason why a cup from that period could not have survived. But it would not be a solid gold chalice or, or whatever. It would be something very simple, um, probably made of wood. Um, just a very simple, ordinary utensil that was just used at a meal. Even here, the experts can't agree. The Romans did use wood, but they also used pottery and terracotta. It's unlikely that they would have been an elaborate object. Um, stone objects, probably pottery objects. I mean, at the time, of course, the Romans were very much in evidence in that, in that period, of, in that place in the world. And they would mostly have used terracotta um, objects. Not wood, but probably terracotta. If it was used at the Last Supper, the disciples would have been in no mood to collect the tableware. They wouldn't have bothered about the cup. Um, they, they would have left the house where they were and left the, the furnishings. And after the crucifixion, of course, they were all completely shattered, demoralized. I don't have to prove that any of these things 
are not the Holy Grail. You have to prove that one of them is. In this program, we'll examine the competing claims of four of the pretenders to the title and the mysteries and legends surrounding them. Our journey starts in England, in the Dark Ages, when history was little more than legend. A time of bloody battles, of sorcerers, and of King Arthur. The Dark Ages were barbaric. It was brutal, life was short, but it's from this chaos that the story of Arthur appears. He is the light. The story of the Holy Grail is forever tied up with King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Out of the pagan chaos, blood and guts, come tales of great Christian knights on quests, a celebration of chivalry, honor, and courtly love. Tales of Camelot, of Excalibur, of Merlin the Magician, and of the greatest quest of all, the search for the Holy Grail. There's little evidence King Arthur ever really existed. He was most likely a fictional creation of the great medieval romance stories, like Parsifal and Mort d'Arthur. Riders were paid by Crusader patrons in return for making them and their fellow knights look heroic on their quests for the grail. Medieval Vanity Publishing. They were written for a very, very small elite. They were not popular novels. They were not like the novels of Barbara Taylor Bradford. They were very, very intellectual fictions, and they were fiction. The Holy Grail that we know today is most definitely a creation of the 12th century romance writers. There can be no doubt about that whatsoever. And wherever the crusading knights are going from, from France, from Spain, they're reading a Grail romance, if they can read. Otherwise, they're having it a bard or a troubadour is singing it for them. These are the great bestsellers of their time, and then the cult of the Grail grows up. In these medieval bestsellers, King Arthur and the Holy Grail are the embodiment of all that's good in the land. They stand for great knighthood, chivalry, and the fellowship of the Round Table. But in reality, Britain in the Dark Ages was a land torn apart by warring lords, a land still mired in magic and mystery. And it would be a mistake to think of them as howling superstitious barbarians. But they did, certainly did have a different idea of how the world worked. So there's a map in the Cathedral of Her Hereford which shows the world as the medieval world saw it. And at the edge, it actually says, here be dragons. So it was a time where things could get very um, tense, shall we say, very, very quickly. Our quest takes us first to Glastonbury in England a place steeped in the mystery of the Holy Grail. In 1191, the monks of Glastonbury Abbey found an oak coffin buried in their grounds. They claimed it contained the remains of King Arthur. Fastened to the coffin was a lead cross inscribed with the following words. Here lies in a sepulcher the famous King Arthur in the island of Avalon. According to legend, after the crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea brought the Holy Grail with him to Glastonbury, where he founded a simple place of Christian worship. Over a thousand years later, this became the great Glastonbury Abbey. Then in 1485, 
when Henry VIII broke away from the Vatican so he could divorce Catherine of Aragon, he ordered the destruction and sacking of Catholic monasteries across the land. Fearing for its safety, the monks of the abbey are said to have dropped this grail into a deep well. For hundreds of years, it lay hidden. Then in 1906, a local mystic, Wesley Tudor Pole, had a vision of the grail underwater in Glastonbury. He knew of a well in the abbey, and when he dug beneath it, he found a small glass bowl. It became known over time as the Glastonbury Grail. Today, the site is known as the Chalice Well Gardens. At the Chalice Well, we do have an artifact. This is known as the Blue Bowl or the Chalice. And it's a, a beautiful object. Uh, we don't generally show it in front of the cameras because we believe that it's special and the quality of it can be uh, best felt by a personal experience. The bowl is made of glass. It's probably about six inches in diameter. It is rather like a deep saucer in shape. And it can be sat upon a table. It balances itself quite nicely. It's uh, semi-translucent and set within the glass uh, are patterns made of silver foil and a darker glass. The, the overall color is blue, but the darker glass inside, which is set within the bowl, is more of a, a dark green or turquoise color. Could a glass bowl really be the true holy grail? Could it have survived being dropped down a well shaft? Little analysis has been done on the dish to establish its age. Some say it's medieval and possibly Venetian. Others that it's Roman, predating Christ. And it is known as a Mille Fiore work or design that was known in Venice and in pre-Venetian times in the Middle East. While there's little evidence to prove this bowl is the true grail, it does have many believers and thousands of people come to visit it every year. The chalice, or blood well, as it's also known, is on the side of an ancient spring, and its waters have been a place of pilgrimage for thousands of years. Rich in iron, the water leaves a distinct red stain, which is held to be symbolic of the blood of Christ flowing from the Holy Grail. In actual fact, the healing quality of the water is not related to its high iron content, but to a more subtle element. It's what we call primary water. And primary water comes from very deep below the earth. Most likely it's been there for thousands of years. It could be that somewhere on its underground journey, the water goes through a, a, a bed of crystal rock or something like that, some deep seam of crystal within the earth that imbues the water with a healing quality that's held within the water, within the very molecules, until it, it uh, is released here. The well may indeed have healing powers, but that doesn't prove this bowl is the true Holy Grail. The story of Joseph of Arimathea bringing the Grail with him to Glastonbury from Jerusalem is just that, a story. The whole of the Joseph of Arimathea legend is very difficult to substantiate, and you have to accept that legend if you're going to accept the context in which this bowl was, was founded. And as it becomes the place where the Holy Grail was supposedly buried, the place where the kind of spiritual author story is being set, then here again, we're getting this idea that here is this grail. Here is people are coming to this for spiritual, spiritual enlightenment, and they undoubtedly find it. The, the fact is that thousands of people have come and continue to come to Glastonbury every year to be near it, and some do have experiences. I, I, I can't explain that. Do they see a grail? To many, yes. Is it the grail? Any object that is believed in becomes what people want it to be. So if enough people are convinced that an object is the grail, then to all intents and purposes, it is what they believe it to be.
In the 13th century, several hundred years after King Arthur, at the same time the Grail romance stories were sweeping across Europe, the Crusades were casting a bloody shadow across the Holy Land. Their aim was to bring Christianity back to the Holy Land, but the Crusades quickly descended into bloodshed, carnage, and pillaging on a grand scale. Each brutal victory bringing more spoils of war. Back in Europe, the Christian church was keen to get hold of as many holy relics as possible, as they were the tangible evidence of the existence of Christ. Pieces of the true cross, the crown of thorns, fragments of his shroud, but no relic was more sought after than the cup Christ used at the Last Supper. Crusaders returned home weighed down with cups, chalices, and mugs, all claiming they were the true grail. By 1500, Europe was awash with holy relics. Without those relics, say the bones of a particular saint or what have you, you would simply not have got people through your doors. It's as simple as that. There was a mania for everything Christian, and tangible proof was the order of the day. Um, so clearly there was a certain amount of, shall we say, sharp practice. A couple of wide boys selling the credulous crusaders anything they happened to want. A piece of the true cross, um, a genuine phial of Jesus' blood, um, and it, it, it went on to um, the Virgin Mary's breast milk, um, the heads of John the Baptist, young and old. Um, the absurdities mounted. Apparently there's enough pieces of the true cross to build three of them. It's absurd. Michael Bajant, the controversial author of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, has spent over 30 years investigating the Holy Grail and other relics, sorting out the fakes from the genuine articles. He describes it as a shadowy world of wealthy private collectors, black market deals, and religious conspiracies. The collection of holy relics today is just as cutthroat as it was at the time of the Crusades. I mean, one of the problems, of course, with the whole Grail story is that we think it's a thousand years ago, but it's not. Most people don't understand the passions that are involved today in the collection of holy relics, both in those who want them and those who would like to hide them away. I've seen many, many utterly incredible objects which have clearly been smuggled out of countries can never be shown to anybody because they'd have to be returned. And they've been purchased by not such a large group of people, but people for whom large sums of money can change hands and no receipts are required. There's material there which would cause a storm. Although his views are deeply unpopular with many Christians, in Holy Blood, Holy Grail, Bajan argues the Holy Grail is not a chalice or cup, but a bloodline descended from Christ himself. You have to understand that in the medieval times, the word Grail was pronounced Song Graal, the Holy Grail, but of course, Song Graal can also be split as Song Real, which is blood royal, i.e. a bloodline. And we find this reflected in the Grail legends themselves, where they speak of the most holy bloodline deriving from Jerusalem. The implication, of course, Jesus had babies. Bajant believes Mary Magdalene went to France after the crucifixion and bore the children of Jesus. There's very little evidence to support this, and Bajan's views have been trashed by biblical historians and academics. Since the book's been out, there's been a lot of attempts to pull it to pieces, and it survived them all. There's been nothing which has been found which opposes the basic theories it produces, the basic reconstruction of history 
that it shows stands. It's not a historical story. Um, it really doesn't work historically, but it is very, very attractive. And people like this idea. It's hopeful, it's positive, it has an enormous appeal. Well, there is uh, as much, or if, or if you like, as little evidence for the bloodline theory as there is for any of the grail chalices out there. Bajan's views are controversial, and he's been repeatedly attacked by the church. He claims documents proving his bloodline theory are locked away in the Vatican and are never likely to see the light of day. The Vatican has had about 1,500 years to get very good at hiding stuff away and to get very good at changing people's minds who may perhaps be thinking the wrong way. I've had personal experience of documents disappearing into the bowels of the Vatican. We've met people during the course of our research who've reported very, very interesting documents disappearing into the Vatican. And I can tell you that I have seen documents and handled documents which run utterly counter to things in the New Testament and which the Vatican would love to have in their archives locked away, but hopefully they will never get them. The bloodline theory has its supporters, but we're looking for a tangible object. Of the hundreds of cups and chalices that poured into Europe during the Crusades, there's one with a history that's convinced many that it's the true Holy Grail. A small stone cup that's been hidden away in Spanish monasteries for centuries. The Santo Caliz, the Valencia Cup. According to legend, St. Peter took it to Rome in the first century AD, less than 20 years after the crucifixion. Then later, when the Romans were persecuting the Christians, the Pope sent it to Spain for its safekeeping. It's the only grail officially recognized by the Vatican. The Valencia Cup has a legend which is very typical of the Grails, in that it has appeared suddenly. It was kept hidden for many years to prevent it from being stolen. It was brought by a crusader. It has all of the elements. And of course, there is actually no visible history here. But when it appears, it's this wonderful sort of sardonyx cup set as a chalice. Um, and it's something which is very precious to the people of Valencia as a symbol of who they are rather than the grail. But what's interesting about the Valencia cup is that it does actually have a papal blessing. The cathedral believes the Santo Caliz to be priceless. And it's kept in high security in its own vault. I think the Valencia Cup is the Holy Grail of the Lord's Last Supper. If the Grail has survived, then it must be the Valencia one. The Grail legends of the whole of Europe are now increasingly thought to have their own origins in this chalice. This beautiful chalice of translucent stone is the origin of the Grail legend. But could this cup date back to the crucifixion? The chalice is made of different materials. The top sacred part is agate, finely polished like glass. The base is a different polished stone. Both the handles and stem are gilded silver. In 1960, Professor Antonio Beltran of Zaragoza University undertook a close examination of the Santo Caliz. 
What I can guarantee and give you my word is that the chalice in Valencia Cathedral was created in a workshop in Alexandria or Antioch, no earlier than the second half of the first century BC and no later than the first half of the first century AD. From an archaeological point of view, we can't say that it's definitely the Holy Grail. What we can say without a doubt is that it might be. There is no reason for it not to be the Holy Grail. Despite Pope John Paul giving the cup his blessing in 1982, many experts do doubt its authenticity. Whatever relics that the, the, the Pope may bless or, or modern day um, religious authorities may claim to be the Holy Grail is simply the same old story going round and round and round. This is the relics trade again. By saying that certain artifacts are genuine, this is only going to bring people to them. Um, and it doesn't convince me at all of genuineness or, or what have you. Um, because if they're, how, how can they possibly prove that a cup was, was transported by St. Peter or, or Joseph or anybody else? There, there is just no way of actually verifying this. I call it uh, Grail Envy. The church in Europe, when it read the Grail stories, projected a Grail fantasy onto any mundane chalice or dish that it had had lying around since the Crusades. <laughs> Good marketing. Medieval spin. If you say that this is the Holy Grail, you've got a problem. You've got a problem of proof. And I don't have to prove that any of these things are not the Holy Grail. You have to prove that one of them is. The Valencia Cup's not the only holy relic locked away in a cathedral that claims to have come from the Last Supper. Housed today in the Cathedral of Genoa in Italy is a large emerald green glass dish the Sacro Catino. It was believed to have been brought back from the Crusades in the 12th century, whereupon the then Archbishop of Genoa claimed it was the actual dish Jesus and the disciples ate lamb from at the Last Supper. Genoa was instantly put on the map. Thousands of pilgrims flocked to the cathedral to see it. For centuries, the people of Genoa believed they had a genuine relic from the Last Supper a priceless dish imbued with divine powers. But in the 1950s, analysis dated the glass to 16th century Venice. Another Last Supper relic bit the dust. The Sacro Catino is an ancient object. It is probably from somewhere between 100 years before and 100 years after Christ. Is a mysterious and very beautiful object linked to Jesus Christ and the Last Supper. People believed it was the dish on which the lamb was served, the lamb eaten by Christ and the disciples, the sacred Passover lamb. As a professional historian, there is no evidence to prove the existence of the Holy Grail. However, as a human being, I find the object truly really fascinating. Devo dire che questo oggetto ha un suo fascino. Questo fascino lo emana ancora oggi. It would be exciting to think that it was really the plate used 2,000 years ago by a man who made such a mark on history. Utilizzato 2,000 anni fa da un uomo che ha lasciato un'impronta così importante e che ha cambiato tutta la storia del mondo. In medieval Italy, as well as in medieval Europe, relics were central to faith and to political and social life. Nowadays, the issue of authenticity may be seen as a problem, but it certainly wasn't in the Middle Ages. Or at least, in the Middle Ages, the problem of authenticity of relics wasn't felt in the same terms as it is today. Relics were authentic because they were presented as authentic by the authority that was able to have the last word on the matter.
our third contender for the True Grail, is another Crusader relic that is believed to have been brought back from the Crusades and taken to Ross Lynn Chapel in the hills outside Edinburgh in Scotland, the spiritual home to an ancient order, the Knights Templar. Legend has it that while the Knights fought to defend Jerusalem in the 12th century, they discovered great treasures buried beneath the ancient Temple of Solomon, including the Ark of the Covenant and the Grail. Andrew Sinclair, a direct descendant of Crusader and Templar Sir William Sinclair, has spent years researching the history of the Templars and their treasures. In 1998, Sinclair made a fascinating discovery at a Masonic Lodge on the Isle of Orkney, off the west coast of Scotland. A 15th century scroll, which he claims is a Templar treasure map, which he believes shows the Grail could be buried inside Rosslyn Chapel. It is an 18 foot long, six foot square scroll. I looked at it, I looked at all the symbols on it, I couldn't believe my eyes. Sinclair took the scroll to experts at Maudlin College in Oxford for radiocarbon dating. They concluded it was a genuine 15th century map. What I've done was discover the oldest medieval scroll in the whole of Scotland, possibly in the whole of Britain. But most incredibly, there was a map. Now, and the map, on the map, which was the shape of the Temple of Solomon, it was the shape of Rosslyn Chapel. And on it, they marked two vaults, as we knew were in Rosslyn Chapel. And in those vaults, they put the symbols of the Ark and the Grail. The Templars were an order of knights founded during the Crusades. They fought with great skill and bravery, defending Jerusalem at all costs, and were easily identifiable with their long white tunics adorned with red crosses. They came back from the Holy Land immensely wealthy, which gave rise to legends of them finding treasure or even secret knowledge buried beneath Jerusalem. Their power in Europe was a threat to the French king, who accused them of devil worship among other crimes. And most of the order were executed, but not before some managed to escape to Scotland. The Templars are sort of the favorites right now for the finders of the Holy Grail. There's always been this feeling that something else was going on. There's no evidence for this, but there's always been this feeling that they, they somehow brought back sacred relics or secret knowledge or whatever. And certainly the um, estimates of their, their treasure were vastly overestimated, as always happens. So in the absence of these great treasures, they were wealthy, but not not immensely so, people have thought, oh well, maybe there was something else. And this starts the idea that somehow the Templars had found something under the Temple Mount, the Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, the Shroud of Turin, you name it. If it's a dodgy relic um, or a hidden treasure, the Templars will be involved. Many experts are skeptical of Sinclair's belief the Templars buried the Grail beneath Rosslyn Chapel. The idea that the Knights Templars hold the chalice that we call the Holy Grail, the answer is no. It's a ridiculous claim, absolutely ridiculous. There is no association with the Templars and the Grail other than they share the same sort of period in history. In June 2001, Sinclair convinced the owners of Ross Lynn Chapel to allow him a detailed examination of the site. We first did a ground scan of Ross Lynn Chapel, and that showed absolutely that they were, as history showed also, secret vaults, one under the altar and one under the main floor, with even a point a marker down the middle. Sinclair then asked permission to excavate. 
and we begin drilling. We knew that there was a side vault, which apparently connected to the main vault. We got into this side vault, steps going down, the greatest moment of my life. I go down these steps, and there is a vault there in it, three broken coffins and a small wooden bowl. Now, that was one of my great excitements, just a workman's bowl. It looks medieval. It's at Rosslyn there now, but that's all there was. Was Sinclair close to finding the Holy Grail? And what lay behind the wall? We tried again next night. We, we got something called an endoscope. We drilled right through the main floor and we pushed this thing, a little camera at the end, to see. But again, we couldn't film. The chamber below the vault was so full of rubble, and so much rubble fell into the hole we made for our camera, we didn't get a shot. Just what lies beyond the wall remains a mystery. I mean, at the end, I really thought, well, this is a mystery. And perhaps one isn't meant to find a grail. The point about looking for the grail is it's a quest. You never find it. You can't actually reach it. It's, it's a quest. Had Sinclair actually hit upon the secret of the grail? That it's a never-ending quest? Rosslyn Chapel really is the equivalent in many ways of a medieval garden gnome. It's a fantasy. It's a folly. But because it's such a fantasy and a folly, and because it's so beautiful, all kinds of stories have, have arisen about it. And one of them suggests that murders were committed, that there are relics of the, of the new world there, and the, the one that's popular now is that the Holy Grail is buried underneath the floors, although nobody somehow has been able to find it. I think it is there. I just wish that Sinclair had ploughed on when he reached the inner wall. I think Rosslyn Chapel has many secrets to give up. It is the Templar's treasure chest. I won't get to the Grail, but I've identified it. I've got as close as anyone has, perhaps for hundreds of years, but it is for someone else to find it, and not for me. Our fourth contender for the true Holy Grail takes us to Aberystwyth on the North Wales coast. For over a century, Nanteo's house has been home to an ancient wooden cup, said to possess healing powers and believed by some to be the real Holy Grail. It is rarely filmed and is damaged from centuries of use. The Nanteus cup, certainly the wooden cup, looks more like what would one would imagine the grail to be, this rather scruffy, ordinary object, much more so than the medieval illustrations, which depict jewel chalices or great sort of elaborate things. So yes, from that point of view, one can perfectly understand why this particular object would be thought of as the grail. So it does have this mystique about it, and it's kept in a lovely box, and it's velvet lined, and all the little letters are with it, and anyone who who wants to use the cup is still allowed access to it. So it does have um, a whiff of mystery about it, which the other grails, it has to be said, do not. The Nanteos cup was one of many objects in Victorian England at the time that was said to have mysterious, even magical powers. We're at a time, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th, when you have people losing interest in Christianity and taking up the occult in various forms. Uh, these, this is the age of the Ouija board, um, table turning, all that kind of stuff. And you've got an ancient, you know, you've got a 400 year old relic in your hands. It looks so battered that it must be much older than that. And there are other claimants be the Holy Grail, why not ours? George Powell, the owner of Nanteo's house, found the cup in the late 19th century under the ruins of Strata Florida Abbey. It's a simple wooden drinking bowl, which according to their legend, was used by Jesus at the Last Supper. It is supposed to have been brought to, to what is we now call England by Joseph of Arimathea, whom as we do know, buried Jesus, 
Um, and he is supposed to have left the cup at Glastonbury along with the Holy Thorn. It is supposed to have been revered at Glastonbury for throughout the centuries until the time of the Reformation when the monastery was shut down. Seven monks are supposed to have escaped over the hills to Wales to the fastnesses of the Cambrian Mountains where they treasured the cup and as they died off one by one they passed the cup to each other until the last one who died left it to Squire Stedman of Strata Florida Abbey. According to legend, the Nanteas cup is olive wood and goes back to first century Palestine. But it was looked at by the Commissioner for, for Monuments in Wales, who was a specialist in wood. And when he examined it, he said it was exactly the right size and shape for a maize bowl, which indeed it is, and that it was witch elm and that it was 14th century. George Powell put the Nanteos cup on display to the public in 1878. By then, it was already creating quite a stir as a healing cup. There is certainly evidence in the 19th century that the cup of Nanteus was actually used to heal. People would borrow the cup, would leave something as a, a pledge, and they would drink from the cup. And there are a number of little bits of paper associated with the cup which say, borrowed by so-and-so at such a time, returned such a time, and in red in the bottom it's written, cured. And certainly I've come across people who have had friends who were cured by the cup. It's never direct, but it's always someone I know, someone I know. In 1906, Mrs. Margaret Powell, the then owner, published a leaflet describing the Nanteos cup as the Holy Grail. There is absolutely no evidence on its behalf whatsoever. It's a late medieval drinking bowl of the kind called a Mesa cup. And of course, if you want to believe that it's the grail, and if you want proof, well, you've got to find the proof. I don't have to prove that it's not the grail. The believer has to prove that it is. I, I once had a letter from a dear lady in America who described her feelings on handling this object. Well, they were very intimate feelings. The thrill she had from that was one she should only have had with her lover and not from handling a piece of medieval wood. So the historian in me says, no, they can't exist. And the romantic in me says, I like the Nanteus cup most of all. Our search for the Holy Grail ends in the ancient ruins of the city of Antioch in Turkey one of the three great Roman cities of its day. In 1910, a team from Princeton University unearthed a collection of silver treasure. One of the objects was truly remarkable, a large silver and gilt chalice engraved with scenes from what was thought to be the Last Supper. Had the Princeton team dug up the Holy Grail? Many thought they had and the find did make headlines all around the world. I believe that it's highly unlikely that um, a cup from the Last Supper would have been saved, but it is highly probable that Joseph, or a wealthy Christian, possibly a close friend of Jesus's, would have commissioned a cup after Christ's death to commemorate the Last Supper. And if you were a wealthy Christian wishing to commission a ornate silver chalice in the first century AD, where would you go? Antioch, the silver capital of the Roman world. According to the experts, the great chalice of Antioch was made somewhere between 500 and 550 AD, and the engravings are believed to be the earliest known depictions of the 12 disciples and Christ at the Last Supper. It was suggested that the inner silver was the grail and the outer case was added on. Later it was suggested that a small wooden bowl is, is encased in the silver. All kinds of wonderful legends. Its origins are, are, are a bit shrouded in mystery. Um, certainly it comes from either Antioch or nearby. 
Um, it was found at the beginning of the 20th century. It was put on display in Chicago at the World's Fair as the Grail, and then it was bought by Rockefeller and presented to the Cloisters Museum, to the Medieval Museum in New York. So after it was found, it's had um, a journey as interesting as any of the journeys of the Grail in the romances. And this, again, adds to its mystery. While it's unlikely any cup would have been kept after the Last Supper or crucifixion, many historians do believe a grail may well have been commissioned by a wealthy follower of Jesus to commemorate his passing, and that this object became venerated in early Christian circles. Out of this, the first stories of a holy grail were born. Many believe the great chalice of Antioch is the most credible of the grail contenders both because of its engravings, the workmanship, and where it was found. But there's no way of knowing for sure. Nearly a century after it was unveiled as the Holy Grail at the World's Fair in Chicago, the Great Chalice of Antioch remains under lock and key in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, buried in its vast catalog of Byzantine treasures. What could be the greatest of all holy relics is simply too controversial to be recognized as such today. Our quest has taken us from the Last Supper in the Holy Land to the Valencia Cup in Spain, from the Glastonbury Grail in England to the Nantios Cup in Wales, and finally from Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland to the Great Chalice of Antioch in America. For those who believe in them, with their extraordinary legends and histories, each one of these objects is, in its own way, a Holy Grail. We do need a Holy Grail. Um, we may not call it the Holy Grail, but insofar as the Holy Grail is an aspiration, something we aspire to, we do need it or if we don't need it, we ought to. There may come a time when, yes, we do find it, but that's something that doesn't apply to today, maybe not tomorrow. It may represent a higher state of, of, of human consciousness, and then we may find the grail. I think that anyone who follows their curiosity, looking for meaning or looking for what lies at the base of spirituality, is on their own grail quest. And I think this is actually the point of the whole legend. There is an individualism about the Grail quest. It's one person against fate almost. I think it's a, a symbol that we can all actually uh, feel quite happy with. Each of the objects is a Grail. Are they the true Grail? I believe that that is in Roslyn Chapel. Will we ever find it? I hope so. <laughs> there is no end to the Grail quest. You never get back to Camelot. And that is the point. No, the quest goes on in different forms because if it is a quest, which it is for everybody, for some form of divine understanding, it never ends. It cannot end.